All right, so let's start with the Costiere du Nîmes and a beautiful photograph by, uh, of uh, just so you can see the landscape and the first one showed you the Rome um, and just the spirit of the place. And let's go back, please, one slide. Li Ming, we need to go back. There we are, thank you. So that's great. So that's a great photograph of the landscape. And uh, forward one slide, please. And so the first expression there is fresher maritime, and that means vibrancy of a maritime climate. As Sabine noted, it's the southernmost AOP in the Rhone, and that means it's closest to the Mediterranean, and that means that there's ocean and marine influence. And so you have this warm Mediterranean climate, but at the same time, you have a diurnal shift at night because you have marine influence and breezes and cooler temperatures. In 1986, Cochier de Nîmes was awarded an AOC, and since 1989, it's been part of the Rhone Valley Association in Toronto. Last year, the production, 3,680 hectares, equals about 177,594 hectoliters. The average yield here is 54 hectoliters per hectare. And for those of you like me who are metrically challenged, the conversion is one ton to the acre to 13.5 hectoliters per hectare. So the average there is about four tons to the acre, just over, which is really, really low for a large area. In terms of export markets, 40% of the total production is exported and China, US and the UK are major markets. And next slide, please. A little bit of history about the area. <clears throat> One of the things for me, and I have to tell you, I'm a huge fan of uh, antiquity in Roman and Greek history. And so I was thrilled to be in the Southern Rhone uh, last year. In fact, in Arles, there's a remarkable uh, Roman uh, antiquity museum. But the history of Costiere de Nîmes goes back to the fifth century BCE, uh, where Greeks began to develop viticulture and winemaking. In 31 BCE, the Ro Roman legionnaires returning from the Egyptian campaign, and by the way, that's the same campaign that involved Cleopatra and Mark Antony, but they settled in what is now Nîmes and expanded vineyards and winemaking. Can I From interject there, there found... Tim? Isn't that the genesis of their um, the palm and the crocodile um, uh, expression? That logo that you see that we see. It's exactly it. Yeah, good, mm -hmm. good thought, Madeline. Uh, fast forward into the Middle Ages. The Abbey of Saint Gilles was founded in the 12th century, and with it, the establishment of the Knights of Hospitalier of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem, and that was one of many medieval Catholic military orders. Also in the Middle Ages in the 14th century, the papal schism uh, at the Avion Papal Court, the wines of Costiere de Nîmes were among the most popular. And then finally, in the 20th century, uh, well, kind of a hybrid of the 17th century, 20th century, first of all, the building of the Canal du Midi in the 17th century, which served as a long time as really a water artery between inland Costiere de Nîmes and the Mediterranean. And then finally, in 1955, the construction of the Canal du Bas Rhone du Languedoc, which supplied water from the Rhone and really expanded agriculture and viticulture throughout the area. I mentioned a few moments ago what's important about Costiere de Nîmes and what sets it apart from other Appalachians in Rome that are further inland and landlocked is its proximity to the Mediterranean. And that means there's marine influence and at night that means a wider diurnal shift that the, you know, the land and the vines have time to cool off uh, to you know, basically respire from the heat of the day. And that means that the grapes retain higher natural acidity, and the wines also retain higher natural acidity. And here are the numbers and things at a glance for the region. Uh, in terms of wine styles produced, 7% are white, 43 are rosé, and then 50% are red. Last year in 2019 production, 3,600 80 hectares producing 177,594 hectoliters. Here's a list of the major grape varieties. We need to go back, thanks. So white grape varieties, Grenache Blanc, some of these not a surprise that you find in other places in the Rhone, such as Marsan and Roussan, 
Verbalonk, Claret. Verbentino was a surprise for me. And of course, Viognier. Red grapes, of course, Grenache, Syrah, Morvedra being really the stalwarts, and then also Canyon and Senso. Uh, the production farmed organically, the percentage is 14%, and it's increasing all the time. Males' major soil types include pebbles, which are locally called grests. These are literally pebbles from the Rhone that have washed inland over thousands of years of time. That combined with sand and clay and limestone. And at this point, I'm going to bring in uh, Michelle to tell us more about it because he knows more than I'll ever know. Michelle, please. Uh, hi. Um, am I on? You guys? Uh... Yes. Um, yeah, I think that you you hit um, you and Madeline have hit all the, the the major points about the appellation. I think that uh, we um, we are part of the Rhone Valley because our soil uh, was of the same creation as the rest of the Rhone Valley. It was uh, pebble deposits uh, about one to two million years ago. What makes us unique and different is our microclimate, and as you explained, the, the, those uh, thermal winds and and just by the way, the, the, the body of water that we saw on that first picture are the marshes of Camargue. That's how close the vineyards are to the water. And the Mediterranean is only a few miles behind those. So the, the vineyards are really against uh, the Mediterranean. And that does uh, create a very unique uh, microclimate within the, within the Rhone Valley. Um, I think that even though uh, the area has been producing wines for um, several thousand years. Um, we are uh, new to the quality game and, you know, in the sense that uh, there is a, a resurgence in the appellation because of the younger generations are coming back, back in. People are totally convinced about the potential uh, of, of the area and the appellation is um, is finding its stride. And its stride is mostly focusing on wines of balance, of freshness, of good acidity. Uh, sometimes uh, the best expression have a little saline quality in the back end. All that that microclimate can uh, allow us to do. So as, as uh, you guys are tasting probably the first wine, a uh, few words on, uh, on Chateau Beaubois is a very good example of what is still a minor production in Costier, as you saw on the slide, whites only represent 7%. Uh, but by and large, uh, it's, a, it's um, uh, a great color for our, our zone. That microclimate allows us to produce wines with uh, crisp, fresh fruit, um, high acidity, and, and uh, very surprising for the Rhone Valley. I mean, when we present all our wines, usually people come out saying, um, you know, I love the wines, but the wines that really surprised me the most are the whites. Uh, so here, uh, a very classic, uh, beautifully done um, example of white Costière de Nîmes, predominantly relying on the Grenache Blanc, which um, with Roussans are the two main white varietals in Costière. Again, a good example of a family winery with Fanny and Francois, the younger generation uh, that have, has come back and is really developing this estate. Uh, and their property is right, right at the bottom of Costier, mm -hmm. right against the marshes of Camargue. So, I have it in my glass. Do you mind if I describe what I'm perceiving please. unless you have it also? No, I'm so I don't, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm very excited about what you're saying because it's really, if we can go back to the previous slide, please, um, just so everyone can see the stats on the wine. Um, I'm going to describe it before I read the statistics actually, uh, because this wine just has wonderful mouthfeel. It's um, lush and flavors of, you know, stone fruit, peach. It's certainly not acid deficient, um, but just enough acidity to be vaguely mouthwatering. Uh, and refreshing, but it's it's a mouthful all by itself. It uh, speaks to perfectly ripe, not overripe. Uh, melons, peaches, apricots, and such. I just love the mouthfeel. Reading the statistics, you can see that the fermentation takes place in um, 
450 liter casks. Uh, it does have uh, leads aging, not super extensive, Zippo oak on this. Um, there's a little dash of Viognier. I don't know as I get it aromatically, but it's certainly, you know, maybe there's a floral characteristic that carries uh, gently and quietly through to the palate as well, but it's really Grenache with a teeny splash of Roussan. Uh, looking at their website, um, speaking to Michelle's point, the brother and sister are young indeed, and so is their um, their whole team. And this, they are organically farmed, and they're um, proud to say they're uh, halfway between uh, Nîmes and the Mediterranean. And uh, they credit the Mediterranean breezes and the Mistral for keeping the mildew down. I have a quick question for Michelle because the stones in the area. Do you, first of all, do you pronounce it grass because it's in the south as opposed to gre? Is that yeah. correct? And yeah. um, I pronounce think, it grass. And that adds to the diurnal shift, uh, the, the lower nighttime temperatures, correct? Because the, the stones, uh, can, you, can you speak to that? Because that's a very yes. interesting uh, point. Yes, actually, um, the, the, when during the day, the sun hits the, mm -hmm. the pebbles and, uh, and they get, superheated so let, let's say uh on a hot day if you try to grab a large pebble at like 3 p.m it's so hot you can't <laughs> hold it in your hands okay because usually they're of a dark color and they absorb the heat so they radiate that heat and they amplify the temperature difference between the air that sits on the mediterranean and the air that sits on the land so the, well, we, we call them thermal winds and they blow part of the day one way, part of the, the other day, part of the day the other way. Like, th think about it. The sea has the same temperature at night or during the day. Okay, If you go swimming at midnight or at noon, you pretty much feel the same way. But the land is cool at night and is warm during the day. And the shift occurs around half day solar time okay so for us it's like 1 to 2 p.m then the soil gets way hotter than the sea the air that sits above rises and it creates a pull and the air that sits on top of the mediterranean gets brought in and that air is not only cooler but it's more humid and the it it kind of gives a breather to the vine that is stressed from not just the temperature but also the dryness of the air. Thanks so, so it's much for speaking to that. It's just so interesting. Um, I, now I think that those those who live in California can probably grasp really well that that phenomenon. We frequently have fog in the morning as well, not as drastic as what you see in uh, you know, on the California coast, mm -hmm. but it's the same logic. Thank you very much. And I hope uh, uh, those of you who have the kits are enjoying the wine as much as I do. It certainly doesn't need food, though it can accommodate um, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, spices and flavors.